concerning the speech of Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, wherein he was speaking about uh, or his statement and whoever does not know the tafsir of the hadith uh, or his intellect cannot grasp it and like this he said he, here he is speaking about uh, the affairs of Al-Qadr what is connected to that and how it is obligatory upon the person to submit and yield to the hadiths of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and here it is proper and befitting that we draw attention to the fact that whoever uh, uh, and what the uh, and what the, the authors mentioned here uh, in connection to ruya the seeing of Allah Taala, he says even if, or uh, and this is even if the hearing meaning when we initially hear these texts, and we don't fully understand them, we don't fully comprehend these texts when we hear them, we still yield and submit to them. He says, and in reality, the Sheikh he says that. And he, the people of Sunnah, when our hearing, when we hear these texts, we are not confused or put off by them at all. We are not confused or put off by these texts at all once we hear them, even if, even if we don't comprehend them and fully understand them. Rather, we submit to what Allah Ta'ala has said and what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said. But rather, it is the people of innovation. It is they who they're hearing, when they hear these texts, they are put off by them and they are taken aback by them and uh, they don't fully uh, submit to them and yield to them. But rather, Ahl Sunnah, uh, they yield and submit to the ahadith when the ahadith reach them, even if they don't fully understand the narrations. <laughs> فإن الكلام في القدر والرؤية والقرآن وغيرها من السنن مكروه ومنهي عنه لا يكون صاحبه وإن أصاب بكلامه السنة من أهل السنة حتى يدع الجدال ويسلم ويؤمن بالآثار. He goes on to mention thereafter and that he does not argue with anyone nor dispute nor should he learn about how to make argumentation in such matters. For indeed, indulging in theological rhetoric in the matter of Qadr and Ru'ya and the Qur'an and other such issues are amongst the ways that are detested and which are prohibited. And the one who does so, even if he reaches the truth with his words, he is not from Ahl Sunnah until he abandons using this mode of argumentation and until he submits and believed in the athar and the narrations of the Prophet alayhi salam and those of the companions. وقضيه المخاصمه والمناظره والمجادله بالهوى والباطل مع اهل البدع بدون ضروره تكلمنا عنها واشار هنا الى الكلام في القدر والرؤيه مكروه والمقصود ايضا الكلام فيها مما يؤدي إلى المعارضة لها وعدم الإيمان أو التشكيك بمعنى طريقة أهل الكلام وأهل البدع فإن خوضهم في أبواب الاعتقاد بهذه الطريقة مكروه ومحرم وليس من هدي سلف الأمة فإنهم ذموا علم الكلام ذما مطلقا قال الإمام الشافعي رحمه الله حكمي في أهل الكلام أن يضربوا بالجريد والنعال ويطاف بهم بالأسواق ويقال هذا جزاء من ترك الكتاب والسنة وذهب إلى علم الكلام فهو علم مبني على العقل وليس على النقل ولذلك ذمه أهل السنة ذما عظيما وخلاصة هذه المسألة هو أمر مهم في مسائل الاعتقاد أنه يجب موافقة أهل السنة في مسائل الاعتقاد في أمرين الأمر الأول في طريقة الاستدلال 
والأمر الثاني في النتيجة التي دل عليها الدليل فأهل السنة يستدلون بالقرآن والسنة والإجماع مثلا ثم النتيجة أن من صفات الله الكلام أما مثلا المتكلمون يقولون العقل يدل على صفة الكلام إذا فإن الله متكلم النتيجة إجمالا إثبات صفة الكلام وإن كان في حقيقة قول المعطلة نفي صفة الكلام لكن هنا وهو قول أهل السنة إما كانت الطريقة خطأ ولو كانت النتيجة صواب فالأمر كله ضلال لأن الاستدلال على غير طريقة السلف لو أداك مرة إلى موافقة الحق سيؤديك مرة أخرى إلى موافقة الباطل يدل على ذلك الله عز وجل لما ذكر القذف وأنه لا يجوز للإنسان يقذف إلا إذا جاء بأربع شهود صح؟ قد يكون رجل رأى فعلا وهو صادق لكن الله سبحانه وتعالى سماه كاذبا فإن لم يأتوا بالشهداء فأولئك عند الله هم كاذبون مع أنه قد رأى لكن لما كانت طريقة الاستدلال أربعة شهود ما جاء بها وإن كانت النتيجة عنده حق سماها الله كلها كذب واضح شيء نعم So the Sheikh of Allah, he mentioned that as it relates to disputation and argumentation, then, and that which is connected to hawa and desires, then batil. <coughs> as it relates to disputation and argumentation, uh, in hawa and in falsehood, then this is something which, an argument with the people of falsehood, then this is something which we already have spoken about. And more specifically, the issues of Qadr and Ru'ya, and seeing of Allah Ta'ala, wa ta and we spoke about them. He says, and this is something which is detested. It is something which is hated and impermissible because it is something which leads to opposition to or doubt in, or the absence of Iman in the truth. And this is the path of the people of Kalam, of theological rhetoric, and the people of innovation. And they do this in the affairs of creed. They do this in the affairs of Aqeedah. Because they say that in the affairs of Aqeedah, they say, for example, that their intellect, the intellect, can conceive and perceive that Allah Ta'ala speaks. So therefore, this means that Allah Ta'ala, He speaks. He says that this is not the path of the Salaf of Salih. It's not the path of the Salaf of Salih as it relates to the affirmation of these things. Uh, and so they would, they would, and the Salaf, they would hate and detest theological rhetoric in all matters. Imam al-Shafi'i, he said that my ruling regarding the people of theological rhetoric is that they are to be beaten with date palm leaves and shoes and then paraded around the marketplace and it is to be said this is the punishment for the one who opposes the book in the sunnah and leans towards theological rhetoric. This is because these people, they give precedence to the intellect over the transmissions and they say that whatever the intellect supports and proves then this is what is considered to be verified and true. And so, due to this, he says that the summary of what has proceeded, and this is from the most important of affairs, that the matters of, a cre the matters of creed and belief, 
that it is obligatory that it be built and predicated upon two matters. Firstly, the method of derivation. The method of derivation. Secondly, the result once the, the, the result once the affair has been derived and proven, I mean, how are we to deal with the, the matter that has been proven and established? And this is what the Sheikh mentioned. Yani, for example, if a person, they say, or the people of theological rhetoric, the Mutakallami says that our intellects can conceive Allah Ta'ala having the attribute of speech. So therefore, this means that Allah Ta'ala speaks and this is the way that they prove and establish it. And so the Sheikh, he says that even though the result it is the true and correct result. The method at arriving at that result is erroneous. So therefore, the total affair in reality is bottom. The total affair in reality is falsehood because they arrived at it. Even though the result is correct, they arrived at the result in an incorrect manner. He says, and this is what he intends by the method of istidlal and derivation. He says, and so even if the result that a person arrives at uh, is, correct, is a correct and sound result, the way that they arrived at it is incorrect, then it means that the entirety of the affair is false. He says, and look, what proves and establishes this is that Allah Ta'ala, he mentioned the affair of Al-Qadh, or accusing chaste believing men or women of sexual impropriety. He, Allah Ta'ala he says that they must bring four witnesses. They must bring forth four witnesses who actually saw the action take place. And if a person were to actually see it himself with his own eyes, he saw the action and that person is considered sorry, he's truthful. He said, but he does not bring forth the four witnesses. The result is correct, meaning he actually saw it because he, he's truthful. But Allah Ta'ala still referred to the one who did so as what? A liar. The one who did so, he's a liar. He says, so therefore, if Allah Ta'ala, he referred to this individual as a liar, why? Because he did not go about it in the proper way. His methodology of derivation was incorrect. So therefore, even if a person arrives at the truth, if his method of arriving there is incorrect, then the entirety of the affair is considered to be bottom. ثُمَّ قَالَ وَالْقُرْآنُ كَلَامُ اللَّهُ لَيْسَ بِمَخْلُوقُ وَلَا يَضْعُفُ أَنْ يَقُولَ لَيْسَ بِمَخْلُوقُ فَإِنَّ كَلَامُ اللَّهِ لَيْسَ بِبَائِنٍ مِنْهُ وليس منه شيء مخلوق وإياك ومناظرة من أحدث فيه ومن قال باللفظ وغيره ومن وقف فيه قال لا أدري مخلوق أو ليس بمخلوق وإنما هو كلام الله هذا صاحب بدعة مثل من قال هو مخلوق وإنما هو كلام الله ليس بمخلوق Then he goes on to mention and the Quran is the speech of Allah it is not created. And one should not be too weak to declare that it is not created. And that the speech of Allah Ta'ala is not something that is distinct and separate from Him. And, not, or, and that not a single thing of it is created. And beware of argumentation with the one who innovates in this matter and says that his recitation of the Quran is created and other such claims. And whoever hesitates in this matter and says, I don't know, whether it is created or not created, it is but the word of Allah, then he is the person of innovation. And he is just like the one who says that it is created. Indeed, it is the speech of Allah and it is not created. Masalatu al Quran wa annahu kalam Allah azza wa jal min al masail al ma'arik bain ahl al sunnah wa ahl al bidah. Wa hasalat al fitnah. العظيمة في عهد الإمام أحمد عذب فيها رحمه الله وقتل من قتل من أئمة السنة من أجل القول بأن الله عز وجل يتكلم وأن القرآن كلام الله غير مخلوق دل القرآن والسنة والإجماع على أن الله عز وجل يتكلم حقيقة وأن كلامه بمشيئة متى ما شاء تكلم ومن كلامه القرآن والتوراة والإنجيل 
فمن القرآن قوله تعالى فأجره حتى يسمع كلام الله وهو القرآن يريدون أن يبدلوا كلام الله أي القرآن وأما من السنة فأحاديث أيضا كثيرة كقوله عليه الصلاة والسلام ألا أحد احملني إلى قومه فأبلغ كلام ربي وأما الإجماع فحكاه طائفة من أهل العلم ونصوا على أن من قال القرآن مخلوق فقد كفر وذكر اللالكائي رحمه الله أكثر من خمسمائة عالم وقال لو أردت أن أزيد لأوصلتهم إلى ألف ألفين وهو في القرن الخامس منذ عصره إلى عصرنا زد العلماء أيضا كلهم مجمعون قال عمرو بن دينار وهو من التابعين أدركت العلماء منذ سبعين سنة وهم يقولون القرآن كلام الله غير مخلوق القرآن كلام الله غير مخلوق منه بدأ وإليه يعود وهذه عبارة يضيفها السلف في القرآن منه بدأ وإليه يعود ومعناها الرد على المعتزلة والأشعرية فمعنى منه بدأ أي أن الله تكلم به ابتداء وسمعه جبريل من الله وأما إليه يعود فتحتمل لمعنيين المعنى الأول صفة تعود إليه أي أنه هو المتصف بها والمعنى الثاني ما ورد في بعض الأحاديث أن القرآن في آخر الزمان يرفع من الصدور والسطور فلا يبقى منه شيء ويبقى الكلام عن طائفتين أشار إليهما ظل في باب الكلام السيد الشيخ فضح الله هي منشن نعم إن الإشياء في القرآن it being the speech of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, this is a point of contention between Ahl Sunnah and Ahl Bid'ah. And as a result of this issue, a great fitna occurred in which Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he was put to trial. And some of the scholars of his time, they were even murdered. The issue of the fact that Allah Ta'ala, he speaks. And the Quran is from his speech and it is not created. As it relates to this issue, it is something which is proven and established by way of the Qur'an, by way of the Sunnah, and by way of Ijma' or consensus. That Allah Ta'ala speaks in reality, and His speech is connected to His Mashi'ah, meaning He speaks when He wills, with what He wills. And the Qur'an is from His speech, just as the Torah and the Injil are from His speech. And so, As it relates to الغير محرفة طبعا الغير محرفة الانجيل والتوراة نعم التي انزلها الله على الانبياء نعم meaning that when the when Allah Ta'ala initially sent down the Torah and the Injil they were the speech of Allah Ta'ala wa Ta'ala before the people changed and altered them and when uh, from the proofs of this 
from the Quran is the statement of Allah Ta'ala and regarding the polytheists that if one of the polytheists come to you seeking your protection then give him protection in order that he may hear the speech of Allah meaning the Quran and likewise the statement of Allah Ta'ala that they desire to change the speech of Allah meaning the Quran as it relates to the proof of this from the Sunnah then the narrations that come in this regard are many from them there is the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is there a man amongst you who will carry me to his people in order that I may convey to them the speech of my Lord and as it relates to the ijma then many of the people of knowledge have reported consensus on this matter and they have textually mentioned in some of their writings that whoever says that the Quran is created is a disbeliever Imam al Ali Ka'i he mentioned that there are about 500 or so of the people of knowledge and some have mentioned that it was even a thousand or two thousand of the people of knowledge who hold to this belief that the Quran is the speech of Allah Ta'ala it is not created Amr ibn Dinar is from the Tabi'een he said that the scholars that I have encountered for over 70 years they have mentioned that the Quran is the speech of Allah and it is not created from him it originated and unto him is going to return he says this term here this part of the definition of the Quran some of the Salaf they added that to the definition of the Quran in refutation of certain groups like the Mu'tazila and the Ash'ariya it means that when he says that from him it began meaning that Allah Ta'ala spoke with it initially and Jibril heard that from Allah wa Ta'ala and the meaning of unto him is going to return it bears two meanings one meaning is that it is an attribute meaning speech is an attribute that Allah Ta'ala is described with and the second meaning is that it returns back to some of the ahadith that have come regarding the end of time and that towards the end of time the Quran it will be raised up and lifted from the chests and from the uh, from where from the parchments upon which it was written and speech remains still regarding two groups that have deviated regarding the affair of theological rhetoric طائفة الأولى هم اللفظية طائفة الثانية هم الواقفة واللفظية قالوا لفظي بالقرآن مخلوق وهي حيلة جهمية لأجل القول بخلق القرآن فلما يقول لفظي يحتمل أمرين إما الصوت واللسان والهواء والشفتين أي ما يصدر الصوت فهذا مخلوق بلا شك وأما ما يسمع فهو كلام الله فهو يأتي ويقول القرآن أو لفظي بالقرآن مخلوق فإذا جاء إلى صاحب السنة قال أقصد اللسان إذا جاء إلى الجهمية قال أقصد القرآن فأغلق أهل العلم هذا الباب وعرفوا كيد الجهمية فقالوا من قال لفظي بالقرآن مخلوق مثل من قال القرآن مخلوق لأنهم جهمية واضح الثاني الواقفة تقول له هل القرآن مخلوق هل القرآن كلام الله قال أقف لا أقول مخلوق ولا أقول غير مخلوق وهذا أيضا كفر لماذا لأنه شك في الله وفي صفاته فهو كقول الرجل أنا لا أعلم هل الله مخلوق أو غير مخلوق هل وجه الله مخلوق أو غير مخلوق هل يد الله مخلوقة أو غير مخلوقة هذا الشك كفر لذلك قالوا الواقفة أيضا جهمية والكلام في صفة الكلام وأدلتها أيضا يطول وهو كثير نعم As for these two groups then the first of them are known as al-lafdiyya and the second of them 
are known as al waqifa As for the first group, al afdiya then they are those who say, my articulation of the Qur'an is created. And this is an open door for the Jahmiyyah. It is, it's an, a, Jahmi, a Jahmi type of leaning. He said, because the one who says that my articulation of the Qur'an is created, it can bear two meanings. The first meaning is one's voice, their tongue, the air, and their lips, all of those things are created. And, sh and it's true, these things are created. And the second meaning that it can possibly bear is what is heard. What is heard, that's what is created. And that is the speech of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, the one who says that my articulation of the Qur'an is created, and this person, he plays games, and if he comes to the person of Sunnah, and he asks him, what does he mean by that? He says, my tongue. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about my tongue, and that's created. But if the same person goes to a Jahmi, he says, I was speaking about the Qur'an. And so Ahl Sunnah, they close the door on these individuals by way, of, uh, by way of this statement, that whoever says in my articulation of the Qur'an, then this person is a Jahmi. He says, and the second of them, the second of them is al waqifa And this is the person who, if he is asked, is the Qur'an created or is it not created, then he says, I'm not going to answer. He refuses to answer, and I, I, I don't know if it's created or if it's not created. And this is disbelief. It's a disbelief. Why? Because it is doubt in reality in this attribute of Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. He says it is equivalent to a person saying, for example, I don't know if Allah is created or if he's not created. I don't know if the face of Allah is created or if it's not created, or if Allah's hand is created or is not created. So due to this, the people of knowledge have stated that is one is also a jahmi, the one who does so, who says uh, that he, he's going to stop and not give a clear answer. This person is likewise a jahmi. Thumma intaqal rahimahullah ila mas'ala al-masa'al li'atiqad wa hiya al-imanu bir-ruyati Allah fi al-dar al-akhir. Qala wa al-imanu bir-ruyati yawm al-qiyama kama ruya an al-nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min al-hadith al-sihah وأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قد رأى ربه فإنه مأثور عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صحيح رواه قتادة عن عكرمة عن ابن عباس ورواه الحكم بن أبان عن عكرمة عن ابن عباس ورواه علي بن زيد عن يوسف بن مهران عن ابن عباس والحديث عندنا على ظاهره كما جاء عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الكلام فيه بدعة ولكن نؤمن به كما جاء على ظاهره ولا نناظر فيه أحدا so then he goes on to speak about another issue from the issues of i'tiqad and creed, and that is the issue of seeing Allah Ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. And he mentions, and to have faith in the ru'ya, or the, that Allah will be seen on the Day of Judgment, as has been reported from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the authentic ahadith. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw his Lord, since this has been transmitted from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and is correct and authentic. It has been reported by Qatada from Ikrimah, from Ibn Abbas, and Al-Hakam, Ibn Aban, reported it from Ikrimah, from Ibn Abbas. Also Ali ibn Zayd reported it from Yusuf ibn Mihran, from Ibn Abbas. And in the hadith, in our estimation, is to be taken upon its apparent meaning. As it has come from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and indulging in theological rhetoric with respect to it is an innovation. However, uh, but we have faith in it as it has come upon its apparent meaning and we do not dispute with anyone regarding it. تكلم هنا رحمه الله عن مسألتين مهمتين متعلقات متعلقتان برؤية الله عز وجل. مسألة الأولى إثبات رؤية المؤمنين لربه. والمسألة الثانية هل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم رأى ربه أو لم يرى ربه؟ أما المسألة الأولى فدل القرآن والسنة والإجماع على أن المؤمنين يرون الله عز وجل بأعينهم في الجنة بأبصارهم يرون ربه أما من القرآن فأدلة كثيرة وجوه يومئذ ناظرة 
إلى ربها ناظرة فأضاف النظر إلى الوجه وعداه بإلى فهذا يدل على أن النظر هنا هو الرؤية والإبصار وقال عز وجل للذين أحسنوا الحسن وزيادة الحسن هي الجنة والزيادة فسرها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في حديث صهيب في صحيح مسلم بأنها رؤية الله في الجنة للمؤمنين وقال عن الكفار كلا إنهم عن ربهم يومئذ لمحجوبون فلما حجب الكفار كان من ثواب أهل الإيمان رؤية الله أما من السنة فأحاديث كثيرة متواترة وردت عن كثير من الصحابة منها حديث جرير إنكم سترون ربكم كما ترون القبر ليس دونه سحاب لا تضامون في رؤيته فمن استطاع منكم أن لا يغلب على صلاة قبل طلوع الشمس وقبل غروبها فليفعل معنى أن هذه من أعظم أسباب رؤية الله محافظة على صلاة الفجر وصلاة العصر وأما الإجماع فحكاه طائفة كبيرة من أهل العلم من ذلك قول عبد الغني المقدسي رحمه الله أجمع أهل الحق واتفق أهل التوحيد والصدق على أن المؤمنين يرون الله في الجنة كما دل القرآن والسنة فمن أنكر ذلك فهو من أهل البدع هذا ما يتعلق باختصار في قضية أن المؤمنين يرون ربهم يوم القيامة نعم Now, so the Sheikh Hafidullah says that within this section, the author he speaks about two very important affairs connected to Ruya or the seeing of the believers of their Lord and hereafter. The first affair is affirmation of the fact that the believers will see their Lord in the hereafter. And the second affair that is spoken about here is did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam see his Lord or not? As for the first matter, the affirmation of seeing Allah Ta'ala by the believers in the hereafter, then this is something which is proven by the Qur'an, by the Sunnah, and the Ijma, that the believers will see their Lord directly with their vision in Jannah. As for the Qur'an, the proofs that come inside of it are many. From them is the statement of Allah Ta'ala, which is translated to mean, faces on that day are gonna be radiant looking at their Lord. So here, Allah Ta'ala, He uh, attached the radiance to the faces. And then He used this preposition, Ilah, as an indication that it will be the result of them looking directly at their Lord. So it's an affirmation of the believers seeing their Lord. Likewise, the statement of Allah Ta'ala, for those who have done well, there is Al-Husna, was ziyada. There is al-husna and something in addition to al-husna. So as for al-husna, this is in reference to Jannah. It is the paradise of Allah Ta'ala. As for the ziyada, the additional thing, then it was explained by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Hadith of Suhaib, the Kant in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. It is the seeing of Allah Ta'ala. Wa ta Likewise, Allah Ta'ala said concerning the Kufar, nay, on that day, they're going to be veiled from seeing their Lord. So since the kufar are going to be punished
by not being able to see their load on the day of judgment, then the reward of the believers is that they're going to be able to see their Lord. Tabarak wa ta'ala. As it relates to the evidence from the Sunnah, then there are many ahadith that are mutawatira that have come from a number of the Sahaba in this regard. From them is the hadith of Jirir, wherein he said, the Namashan of Allah he said, Indeed, you will see your Lord on the day of judgment just as you see the moon on a full moon night with there being no clouds in the sky. And you will not have to crowd over each other and push each other in order to see it. So therefore, if you are able to aid and assist yourself or not let your soul overcome you as it relates to prayer before the rising and the setting of the sun, then do so. So this proves and indicates that perpetuity and safeguarding of Fajr and Asr prayers are amongst the reasons and means that will aid you and assist you in being able to see Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. As it relates to the Ijma, then this affair has been reported from a large group of the people of knowledge. From them there's Abdul Ghani al-Maqdisi in a statement in which he said to the people of Haq and the people of At-Tawheed and truthfulness are in agreement that the believers will see Allah in paradise as has come in the Quran and the Sunnah and whoever rejects this is from the people of Bid'ah and so this is from the affairs that are connected to the first matter the affirmation of the seeing of Allah Ta'ala by the believers in Jannah <laughs> فهي هل رأى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ربه في الدنيا أم لم يره ذكر الإمام أحمد رحمه الله هنا أن ابن عباس أثبت الرؤية وذكر بعض الروايات في ذلك وخلاصة المسألة أن ما ورد عن ابن عباس من إثبات رؤية النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم صحيح أنه ورد بطريقتين الأولى إثبات رؤية النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مطلقا بدون إضافتها إلى العين والثانية إثبات رؤية النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لربه برؤية المنام وأما ما ورد عنه من إثبات الرؤية وقرنها بالعين فهذا لا يصح عن ابن عباس ومثله الروايات عن الإمام أحمد وهذا يذكره شيخ الإسلام تيم ومثله الروايات عن الإمام أحمد الذي صح إنما هو إثبات الرؤية مطلقا بدون العين أو إثبات رؤية المنام أو القلب فجاء بعض طلابه أو أتباعه ففهموا منه أنه يثبت رؤية العين وهذا لا يصح عنه فإذا قول ابن عباس وعائشة فيه إثبات رؤية مطلقة أو إثبات رؤية المنام جاءت عائشة رضي الله عنها وقالت من قال إن محمدا رأى ربه فقد أعظم على الله الفرية فإذا عائشة نفت الرؤية وابن عباس أثبتها مطلقا ورؤية المنام فحقيقة المسألة لا خلاف بين ابن عباس وعائشة رضي الله عنها لأن عائشة نفت رؤية العين وهذا لم يحصل لأحد في الدنيا لذلك النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم سأله أبو ذر قال هل رأيت ربك قال نور أن أراه نور أن أراه وأما رؤية المنام ورؤية القلب فهذه ثابتة لرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وأما رؤية العين فقد قال عليه الصلاة والسلام 
اعلموا انكم لن تروا ربكم حتى تموتوا فاذا يرجع المساله الى اتفاق بين ابن عباس وعائشه وليس الى اختلاف واضح شيء واضح The second important issue that was mentioned here is did the Prophet وسلم, see his Lord in the dunya or not? And Imam Ahmad Rahimahullah, here he mentions text from Ibn Abbas in affirmation of that. And he mentions some other narrations uh, in affirmation of that. And the khulasa, the summary of this issue is as follows. What is affirmed from Ibn Abbas that is Sahih in this matter then it comes about two ways. Firstly, affirmation that is general, without any mention of him seeing with the eye. A general type of affirmation without mention of he, he saw Allah Ta'ala with his eye. And the second path that it comes by way of is affirmation of him seeing him within a dream, meaning the seeing of the heart. He says, as for those narrations that may have come from Ibn Abbas mentioning specifically that he saw him with the eye, then none of those narrations are authentic. He says, and some of them have come from Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, as mentioned by Shaykh al ibn Taymiyyah. So therefore, what is mentioned in a general way that he saw him, there's no mention of him seeing Allah Ta'ala with the eye. And likewise, some of the narrations mention that he saw him in a dream, meaning the seeing of the heart. And some of these students of Ibn Abbas heard these narrations and thereafter and understood them to mean that he saw Allah Ta'ala, he saw Allah Ta'ala with his eye. This is something which is not affirmed from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so what we have that occurred between Aisha and Ibn Abbas regarding this particular issue, wherein Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said that whoever says that the mention of Allah saw his Lord has indeed invented a great lie upon Allah. So here, she is negating the seeing of Allah ta'ala with the eye. And what Ibn Abbas affirmed was the seeing of Allah ta'ala in a dream, meaning the seeing of the heart. So the reality is that there is no difference of opinion between Aisha and Ibn Abbas in this issue. Because Aisha negated the seeing of the eye, and this is something which would not occur for anyone within this dunya. As has come in the narration of Abu Dhar, that he asked the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did he see his Lord? And he said, light. Meaning there was too much light, how could I see him? He says, but as for the seeing, of the Messenger of Allah alayhi wasalam, of his Lord with his heart, meaning in a dream. And this is something which is affirmed from the Prophet alayhi wasalam. And he said, concerning the seeing of Allah Ta'ala in this dunya with one's eye, that you will not see your Lord, you will not be able to see your Lord directly until you die. So this is the summary of what has come regarding this issue. ثم قال الإيمان والإيمان بالميزان يوم القيامة كما جاء يوزن العبد يوم القيامة فلا يزن جناح بعوضة وتوزن أعمال العباد كما جاء في الأثر والإيمان به والتصديق به والإعراض عما رد ذلك وترك مجادلته. Then the author goes on to mention and to believe in the balance, the weighing on the day of judgment, just as it has come to us in the hadith, that a servant will be weighed on the day of judgment and he will not be, he will not be equal in weight to the wing of a fly. And the action of the servants shall be weighed just as it has been reported in the narration, to, to have faith in it and to attest to its truthfulness and to turn away from whoever rejects that and to abandon argumentation with him. من مسائل الإيمان باليوم الآخر الإيمان بكل ما يكون يوم القيامة ومن ذلك الميزان والميزان دل عليه القرآن والسنة والإجماع وأنكره المعتزلة والخوارج لأنهم يقولون 
من ارتكب معصية فهو كافر فلا يحتاج إلى ميزان إذا مباشرة إلى النار أما من القرآن ونضع الموازين القسطة يوم القيام يوم القيام وأما من السنة فأحاديث كثيرة منها آخر حديث في صحيح البخاري ما هو آخر حديث في صحيح البخاري ما آه وليد كلمتان خفيفتان على اللسان حبيبتان الرحمة ثقيلتان في الميزان سبحان الله العظيم سبحان الله بحمده قال ثقيلتان في الميزان وأهل العلم قالوا الصواب أن الذي يوزن في الميزان ثلاثة أشياء يوزن العبد نفسه لحديث يؤتى بالرجل السمين يوم القيامة فيوضع في الميزان فلا يعدل عند الله جناح بعوضة ولحديث ابن مسعود أما تكلم بعض الصحابة عن دقة ساقيه قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم هما في الميزان أثقل من جبل أحد والثاني يوزن العمل ويدل عليه حديث أبي هريرة كلمتان فهذا قول وعمل وضع في الميزان والثالث توزن الصحائف صحائف الأعمال كتاب العبد ويدل عليه حديث صاحب البطاقة فيؤتى بتسعة وتسعين سجلا فتوضع في كفة الميزان وكفة الأخرى فيها لا إله إلا الله بطاقة فتثقل لا إله إلا الله فتطيش الصحائف وهذا القول يجمع بين الأدلة فيوزن العبد وعمله وصحائفه والميزان دلت النصوص على أن له كفتان وأما اللسان فلم يثبت فيه دليل وورد عن بعض التابعين Now, so the Sheikh Hibrah Allah, he says, so from the issues that are connected to belief in the last day, it's belief in everything that will occur on the day of judgment. And from that is to believe in the mizan, in the scale that will be erected upon that day. And what proves and establishes the scale is the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Ijma. And this is something which is negated and objected to by the Mu'tazila and the Khawarij because they say that whoever commits an act of disobedience is a kafir and there's no need to weigh any of his deeds anyway. Allah Ta'ala, as it relates to proof from the Qur'an, Allah Ta'ala mentioned that he will establish upon that day the way of justice. As it relates to the evidence from the Sunnah, that it is the last hadith that comes in the Sahih of, of Imam al-Bukhari. And the last hadith that comes in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari is the statement of the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa that there are two words that are light upon the tongue, they are heavy upon the scales, and they are beloved to Ar-Rahman. And these two words are glorified be Allah and the praise be to him, and glorified be Allah the Magnificent. And so the, uh, the, the shahid here is the statement that they are heavy upon the scales. These words are heavy upon the scales. The people of knowledge, they say that there are three things that are going to be weighed upon that day, upon the day of judgment. The first thing that, that is going to be weighed is the servant himself. The person himself shall be placed upon the scale and weighed. And what proves this is the statement of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that a large and a fat man shall be brought forth on the day of judgment and placed upon the scale 
and he will not be equivalent to Allah Ta'ala to the weight of a mosquito of the wing of a mosquito. And likewise, there's the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, wherein the companions they were speaking amongst themselves, and uh, they found a bit funny the skinniness of his legs. And so the mission of Allah والسلام, he said, uh, he told them, do not laugh at the skinniness of his legs, for by, by he in whose hand is my soul, they are heavier with Allah Ta'ala than Mount Uhud. And the second thing that is going to be weighed is the actions of the servant, his actions themselves. What proves that is the aforementioned hadith of Abu Huraira concerning the two words. These two words, they are action, the action of a tongue. And likewise, what is going to be weighed is the scrolls upon which the actions of the servants are written. What proves this is the well-known hadith of the card, wherein 99 scrolls are going to be brought forth, having the man's sin written upon them. Each scroll, when you roll it out, it extends far as the eye can see. It will be placed upon one side of the scale, and then a card upon which is written, La ilaha illallah, shall be placed on the other hand of the scale, and the statement, La ilaha illallah, will outweigh it will far outweigh those 99 scrolls. This statement brings together and it, it reconciles between all of the proofs regarding the affair of the Mizan. And concerning the description of the Mizan, then its description has come that it has upon it two plates, or two hands, if you will, uh, upon which the, 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 the deed shall be placed. And then there is the Lisan, but Lisan here means like a needle. Uh, a needle that toggles back and forth. Uh, he says, as for the lisan, this is something which is not, uh, there's no proof to establish that. Also, this statement has come from uh, some of the tabi'in. ثُمَّ قَالَ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى يُكَلِّمُ الْعِبَادَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهُمْ وَبَيْنَهُ تُرْجُمَانِ الْإِمَانُ بِهِ وَالتَّصْدِيقُ بِهِ Then he goes on to mention, and that Allah Taala will speak to the servants on the day of judgment without there being any translator between him and them and to have faith in this and to attest to his truthfulness. Thabat sabit al-kalam marra ma'ana wa hadha min adillatih wa huwa ma jaa fil hadith hadith Adi ibn Hatim anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal ma minkum min ahad illa yusayu yukallimuhu rabbuh ليس بينه وبينه ترجمان ودل القرآن والسنة على أن الله عز وجل يكلم أصحاب النار أصحاب الجنة في عدد من المواضع يقول لأهل الجنة هل رضيتم هل أزيدكم إلى غير ذلك من الأدلة وهذا كما قلنا من إثبات صفة الكلام وإثبات الكلام لله ومن الثناء على الله عز وجل ومن أدلة ألوهيته يدل على ذلك أن الله لما أبطل عبادة العجل وأنه لا يستحق أن يكون إلها عجل بني إسرائيل قال ألم يروا أنه لا يكلمهم فدل على أن عدم الكلام صفة نقص no. No. He said, and so as for this issue, then it goes further to uh, emphasize the affair of the speech of Allah Ta'ala, wa ta the Allah Ta'ala, He speaks. And this is from the evidences for it. And it has come in the hadith of Adi ibn Hatim that he said that the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa sallam, said, There's none amongst you except that His Lord will speak to him with there not being between him and his Lord any translator. And the speech of Allah Ta'ala wa Ta'ala or that Allah Ta'ala he will speak to the people is something which is proven by the Quran and the Sunnah. That Allah Ta'ala he will speak to the people of the fire, he will likewise speak to the people of paradise. From them, uh, Allah Ta'ala he will say on the day of judgment, O people of paradise, do you desire anything that I should increase you? And as we said, this is from the uh, affirmation of the attribute of speech for Allah Taala. And to affirm speech for Allah Azza wa Jal, 
it is a form of tina and praising of him, tabaraka wa ta'ala. And it is a proof for his right to be worshipped. Have you not heard that Allah Ta'ala said concerning the people of the Ijl, the, the people who worship the calf, uh, Allah Ta'ala said concerning him, do they not see that it cannot speak? That it did not speak to them. So this is a proof that that which is devoid of this attribute of speech cannot be divine, or cannot have any share in divinity whatsoever. قَالَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكْ وَالْإِمَانُ بِالْحَوْضِ وَأَنَّ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ الله عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ حَوْضًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ تَلِدُ عَلَيْهِ أُمَّتُهُ عَرْضُهُ مِثْلُ طُولِهِ مَسِيرَةَ شَهْرِ آنِيَتُهُ كَعَدَدِ نُجُومِ السَّمَاءِ عَلَى مَا صَحَّتْ بِهِ الْأَخْبَارُ وَالْآثَارُ مِنْ غَيْرِ وَجْهِ Then he goes on to mention and to have iman in the hawd or the, the tank of the mission of the pool of the mission of Allah والسلام, that there is a pool for the mission of Allah وسلم, on the day of judgment his ummah will come to it to drink from it its width is, equi is equal to the distance travel in a month its drinking vessels equaling the number of stars in the sky and this is in accordance with the narrations that are authentic in its regard for more than one aspect أيضا من الإيمان باليوم الآخر الإيمان بحوض النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو مما أكرم الله به نبيه عليه الصلاة والسلام ولكل نبي حوض يوم القيامة ودل على الحوض القرآن والسنة والإجماع أما من القرآن فقوله تعالى إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَرُ وَالْكَوْثَرُ نَهْرٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ يَصُبُّ مَاءُهُ فِي الْحَوْثِ وأما من السنة فأحاديث كثيرة والأحاديث في ذكر الحوض متواترة وأخبر صلى الله عليه وسلم في صفة الحوض أن مسيرته شهر وعرضه كطوله يعني مربع الشكل وعدد آنيته كنجوم السماء ومن شرب منه شربه لم يضم بعدها أبدا والناس يوم القيامة طبعا ودل أيضا على الحوض الإجماع ونقل الإجماع طائفة كبيرة من أهل العلم والناس يوم القيامة حين تدن الشمس من الخلاء ويطول الموقف ينتظرون الحساب ويزيد عرقهم حتى يصل العرق في الأرض سبعين ذراع فيحتاجون إلى الماء يذهبون إلى حوض النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أمة الرسول الملائكة تطرد بعض الناس فيسأل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من هؤلاء أمتي أمتي فيقولون لا تدري من أح ما أحدثوا بعدك ويدخل في هذا من ارتد عن الدين ويدخل في هذا أهل البدع والمحدثات لذلك قال السلف من عقوبة المبتدع لا يرد حوض النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام ولا يشرب منه نسأل الله عز وجل أن لا يحرمنا وإياكم من الشرب من حوض نبينا عليه الصلاة والسلام آمين The Sheikh of Allah Allah He says that likewise from the affairs that are connected to belief in the last day is belief in the hawd or the pool of the mission of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم and this is from that which Allah Ta'ala he know what his prophet with عليه وسلم and each prophet is going to have their own hawd. And what proves this is the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the Ijma'ah. As for the Qur'an, Allah Ta'ala, you mentioned inside of it, indeed we have given you, O Muhammad, al kawthar al kawthar is a river in paradise, the water of which flows into the hawd and supplies its water. And as it relates to evidence from the Sunnah, then there are many ahadith that have come in this regard, and they are mutawatira. And in these narrations, the description of the Hawl has come, 
as the size of it, its distance, meaning in terms of length and width, they are the same distance of one month's journey. The length is similar to its width. As for its cups, they are similar to the stars in the sky, meaning in terms of their number. And whoever drinks from it one time will never thirst again. And Ijma has likewise proven and established the belief in the hold as it has come from a large number of scholars, the affair of the consensus regarding this particular issue. And it has been mentioned that when the people, on the day of judgment, when the sun draws near to the people, and they are worn out from the long standing upon that day, and the, they begin to sweat immensely, to the point that their sweat reaches 70 arms length into the earth. They're going to be in need of water. So they're going to come to the hawl of the Messenger of Allah. I mean, his ummah will come to his hawl. And there's going to be some angels there pushing some of them away. And so the Messenger of Allah, alayhi wa he will say, Who are these people? My ummah, my ummah. It will be said to him, You do not know what they invented in their religion after you. He said, What enters into this meaning of those who apostated from their religion. Likewise, what enters into this meaning are Ahl al the people of innovation. And so, for this reason, some of the Salaf would say that from the punishment of the people of innovation is that they're going to be pushed away and denied uh, the ability to drink from the hawl of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. أن هذه الأمة تفتن في قبورها وتسأل عن الإيمان والإسلام ومن ربه ومن نبيه فيأتيه منكر ونكير كيف شاء الله جل جلاله وكيف أراد الإيمان به والتصديق به Likewise, to have faith in the punishment of the grave and that this Ummah will be put to trial inside of their graves and will be questioned about Iman and Islam, about who is his Lord and who is his Prophet. And that Munkar and Nakir will come to him. All of that is in whatever way Allah Ta'ala wills and whatever way he desires. To have faith in that and to attest to its truthfulness. Min al Iman aydan bil yawm al akhir, al Iman bi adab al qabr. Wal Iman bil qabr. يشتمل على الإيمان بثلاثة أشياء الإيمان بفتنة القبر والإيمان بنعيم القبر والإيمان بعذاب القبر وهذه الثلاث دل عليها القرآن والسنة والإجماع أما من القرآن قوله تعالى في آل فرعون النار يعرضون عليها غدوا وعشيا ويوم تقوم الساعة أدخلوا آل فرعون أشد العذاب فدل على أن هذا العرض قبل يوم القيامة وهو في القبر وقال تعالى يثبت الله الذين آمنوا بالقول الثابت في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة وهذا بمعنى حياة الدنيا هي القبر على أحد التفسيرات وأما من سنة النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام فما جاء في حديث عنه عليه الصلاة والسلام لما مر على قبرين حديث ابن عباس وقال إنهما لا يعذبان وما يعذبان في كبير أما أحدهما فكان يمشي بالنميمة أما الآخر فكان لا يتنزه من البول وأيضا ما جاء عن النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام في حديث فتنة القبر حديث البراء الطويل وفيه ذكر منكر ونكير وحديث أبي هريرة أيضا في سؤال المؤمن سؤال المنافق والكافر في القبر 
وقوله عليه الصلاة والسلام لولا ألا تدافنوا دعوت الله أن يسمعكم من عذاب القبر ما أسمع أي أن عذاب القبر يسمعه البهائم ويسمعه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لكن من أسباب عدم سماع الثقلين لعذاب القبر الأول ابتلاء واختبار هل تؤمن أو لا تؤمن أن هذا من الغيب والثاني قوله ألا تدافنوا بمعنى أنكم لو كنتم تسمعون عذاب القبر لما دفن أحد أخاه ولما اقترب أحد من المقبرة وكذلك يدل عليه الإجماع والأدلة على القبر وإثباته وعذابه ونعيمه أدلة كثيرة واردة في الكتاب والسنة نعم Likewise, from the affairs that are connected to Iman in the last day is Iman and what takes place inside of the graves. And what takes place inside of the graves, this comprises of three affairs. The first of them is the fitna of the questioning that takes place inside of the grave. The second affair is the bliss that some will achieve inside of the grave. The third of them is the punishment that takes place inside of the grave. What proves and establishes this is the Qur'an, the Sunnah, and the Ijma. As it relates to the Qur'an, then Allah Ta'ala said concerning Fir'aun, the fire, they are exposed to it every morning and every evening. And then on the day whereupon the hour is established, they're going to be placed into a, a more severe punishment. And so this proves and establishes that this exposure to the fire, it takes place before the establishment of the hour. This is the punishment of the grave. Likewise, Allah Ta'ala said, Allah will make firm those who believe with the firm statement in the dunya as well as the hereafter. And the firm statement or them, him making them firm in the dunya just refers to the punishment or the, uh, the, 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 the affair of the trial in the grave according to one of the explanations of this verse. As for what has come in the sunnah in this regard, then there is the hadith of Ibn Abbas where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed by two graves and he heard the inhabitants being punished and he said these two men are being punished but they're not being punished for something which was kabir. As for one of them, he would walk about with namima, tail carrying and as for the other, he did not keep his clothing clean from being soiled with his own urine. And likewise, there is the hadith of the trial of the grave, the long hadith of Barah bin Wazib, in which is mention of Munkah and Nakir. Likewise, there's the hadith of Abu Huraira, in which he speaks about the questioning of the believer and the questioning of the disbeliever inside of their graves. The Messenger of Allah والسلام, he said, similarly, that were it not that you would stop burying your dead, I would ask Allah Ta'ala to allow you to hear the punishment inside of the grave. Meaning that the animals, they are able to hear the people being tormented inside of their graves, but I mean, the people are not able to hear that. And it bears two interpretations. The first of them, I mean, was it was connected to their belief in the punishment of the grave. I mean, do you believe in it or do you not believe in it? The second is that if it were not that you would stop burying your dead, you would be afraid to bury your dead, then and he would uh, ask Allah Ta'ala to allow them to hear the punishment of the grave. And what proves this as well is the ijma, is the consensus. And this is something which and there is consensus upon by the people of knowledge in connection to and the affair of belief in the punishment and the bliss and what takes place inside of the grave. بهذا نقف والله أعلم صلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد جزاكم الله خيرا. We will stop here uh, for now and may prayers and peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad عليه السلام. تفضلوا في الأعلى. have coffee.